Welcome to the Mass Transit Bus Stop. Bus Stop is a conversational format video that we started doing last month. It's kind of set up to, you know, discuss what's current in Mass Transit. And I know we just did a bunch of stuff on Kafka. If you haven't watched the Kafka series, I put out a whole uh, three episode series on using Confluent Cloud, MongoDB Atlas, you know, another good sample. Um, Mass Transit has great stream support. And it works with both Kafka and Event Hub. The sample was with Kafka, though, because I wanted to you know, stick to all cloud things. But once again, I got Drew Sellers with me. Drew, say hey. Hey, hey. Um, so we thought it would be really good to just kind of open up with, you know, some thoughts on the video. And, you know, this 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 dichot dichotomy, I don't know if it's a dichotomy, it's it's... It's like streams versus queues. Differences. Yes, differences. Wow, just use a basic word that we learned in fifth grade. That's awesome. Um, so the differences between queues and streams. So we just kind of want to kick this off. You know, for those who are completely unfamiliar, and I'm not going to go super basic on this, but Kafka is, you know, it's messaging, but it's messages in a log. You know, log the the, the messages are written in order. You know, Kafka does a good job of making sure that, you know, the reads are scalable. You can set retention times. So, and you can do partitioning to get all sorts of scale. You know, Kafka is always, you know, in the mind share of, oh, you know, we've got to do massive amounts of event distribution or data distribution or replication. Whereas when we think about a traditional queue type system, you know, I think the key differentiator for me, and Drew, you can tell me if you agree or disagree, is queues consume whereas streams sort of persist. I mean, we definitely know, like these tools are definitely mentioned in the same breath all the time. And I, they both use a lot of the same nouns, events, messages, topics. Uh, one key definition that, you know, as we've been talking, that makes them very different is that like queues drive towards zero. They want to be empty. And Kafka maintains state, so it's kind of like a database in that it, it'll, it's going to grow over time until it hits some fixed length of data. Yeah, I, I, and I think that's the key thing is, and the phrase you keyed on is like, when you look at all the value adds that Confluent Cloud or just even the Kafka ecosystem has, it is treated as a database. I mean, there is KSQL. You can mm -hmm. query a Kafka topic as if it were a database by by the fact that Kafka knows the schema of what's in it and it can turn those, you know, JSON properties or Avro properties into, you know, virtual columns that you can query. So I think that's that's a good distinction. And I like the idea that queues drive towards zero. They want to be empty. Yeah. You know. It's a it's you know, it, I think it's I think it's a very different mindset to think about. The I have seen so one of the one of the ways where I really like Kafka and I don't like Rabbit, where I would have chosen Rabbit pre Kafka, uh, is the idea of populating a search engine. So if I want to populate a search engine with a bunch of data pre Kafka uh, in a queue based system, I would go say to the source system, "Hey, publish your catalog of products." At which point it's going to spew out all of its products, and let's say that's millions of products, are going to go onto the broker, flow through the broker for the sole intent of getting to the search engine indexer. So I had to put a lot of load. I had to put a lot. There we go. I had to put a lot of load on the source system for it to flow through and then put some load on the search indexer. Now, in a Kafka world, especially one with compacted topic, compacted topics, meaning um, as messages are flowing through Kafka, there's another topic that's collecting those messages, keeping one copy, say, per uh, identifier. When I do that, I have the load once on the source system. I then maintain state in Kafka. And then whenever I want to re-index, I can simply do, uh, I can start from the beginning of the Kafka topic and read everything to populate my search engine. So now I'm not double taxing the source system like I would with the queue, because once the queue message is consumed, it's gone. So having that persistent event over time 
unlock some new capabilities. And that, and I mean, you, you nailed it. I mean, that's, you know, people ask me, and I think I even got some feedback on Twitter of like, wow, you know, the CTO said use Kafka, you know, whatever. The, the use cases where I see Kafka making the most sense are the fact that you aren't destroying the events as you consume them from the queue. You know, and when I think of like ERP systems, you know, data delivery systems, even IoT type systems, and that's where you see a lot of that come in is, I'm going to screw up. I'm going to need to start over. I'm going to need to dump an index, like you said, and refresh from zero. I'm going to need, you know, multiple consumers on those topics of events. And a lot of times, you know, if you're like, you know, unless you're like an SAP consultant or a JD Edwards consultant, you're going to be, you know, struggling to like just get data out of your ERP into something that you can work with it on, let alone, you know, saying, hey, how about you guys can, you know, can we write a .NET service that's going to publish messages to RabbitMQ using mass transit from your ERP? And that's just that's just going to land nowhere. Whereas you can say, oh, you're using SAP. We have a material movement connector where anytime a product moves through your system, there's a built-in connector for Confluent Cloud that will listen to those events out of SAP and push those into a topic. And that's Absolutely. like consumption time. Well, and that's the thing. If you... You mentioned JD Edwards, and there are specific uh, like update tables in JD Edwards. So every time something happens, an insert's written to uh, like an audit log. But you still have to have access to JD Edwards. You still have to be able to read it. Uh, but if you had a connector, a JDE connector, that just read those and pumped them into Kafka, now you've got you know, the ability to then go and read Kafka distinct from reading JD Edwards, you, know, you give yourself a lot of power. You could denormalize the data as you're reading it out of JD Edwards into Kafka. You could get rid of JD Edwards <laughs> weird na table names. <laughs> Have you seen SAP's table names? If you don't speak German, sure I don't suggest reading them. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's Better the thing that. is, you know, in the database world, and when you think of DBAs, it's like, oh, how can we do CDC or change data capture based replication so that as changes are made in tables, we can replicate those to, you know, a read database. And there are a lot of expensive products that do that for you. Whereas you can take that same change data capture trigger from the database and use that information to populate topics in a Kafka. And you can even do it smart to say, hey, I know it changed, but maybe I want to pull the data. Or as Drew mentioned earlier, compacted topics in Kafka, you know, as long as Kafka is really kind of cool because you get two parts of the message and you actually have separate serializers for each one, you know, so each message in Kafka has a key and a value and they're just byte arrays in the broker. And I use the word broker because that's what a lot of people think of Kafka as, even though I think of a broker as more queue based, but in a, so the headers are stored separately, but you have a key and a value, and each of those can have its own serializer. And there's built-in serializers for like string, GUID, int, you know, things like that. And if you're doing like a data, a topic per database table or something, you might say, oh, well, let's just make the key the primary key of the table. And then anytime a row is changed, we would just stomp that out and we could have all of those changes, but then we could also have a separate topic that is a compacted topic that only has the latest version. So there's a lot of flexibility in that as a data distribution mechanism, which might include right replication to, you know, like a, a cache, like an elastic search, or it might include consumers reacting or filtering or doing anything that you would do with like a mass transit consumer. Now, one area where I don't like Kafka uh, is in the idea of, I want to do like dynamic dispatch of something. So if I want a downstream system to do a thing, and I'm thinking commands. So there's a nomenclature of command versus event, and command is like, I want this system to do something versus I just want to announce that a thing happened. So the announcing that a thing happened could just as easily be done on Kafka or Rabbit. I feel very comfortable using either of those systems. But if I want to issue a command, I'm really looking for a request response. Here's where I really prefer RabbitMQ over Kafka. So because the queues are trying to drive towards zero, once I've put the message on the queue saying, please you know, make this API call, please process this image, uh, the 
I can pull the message off of the queue. It'll then disappear from the queue. I'll then process the work. And when I'm done, I'll acknowledge the message and it's gone. When I see people try to do commands on Kafka, now those commands are persistent. And so how do you know if you've done that command or not? And if you now have to start to really think about your, your consumer offsets, you have to think about item potency at a whole different level, because what if you uh, restart the offset or you have a new person, a new thing comes online. You don't want that new thing to like reprocess all the commands because they're temporal, they're done at this point. So that's another thing I know that we've talked about in terms of where we see people trying to shoehorn Kafka into something that might be better served as a, as a cube. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's a good shift in tone is like, why are queues better sometimes? And yeah, that chase towards zero, that request response. I've had people, you know, early when writers first came out, it was like, well, why, why can't I do request response on Kafka? And I just was like, because you wouldn't, I mean, you know, event distribution, data distribution, you know, you know, real time replication. These are the things that Kafka is, it's, it's, it's the sweet spot. You know, and yes, we have used RabbitMQ or even Azure Service Bus for data replication. And, you know, in the early days of command query responsibility segregation and all of that, it was like, oh, how do I update my read store? Oh, we'll just put events on the message bus and then those events will be consumed by a consumer, which will update, you know, a Redis or MongoDB table that's out at the edge. And now what we're seeing is that, you know, Kafka can do that. You can still do it with RabbitMQ. It's just you're not going to have the history. You know, your your cold start is going to be tough because all of those events are gone. And then you end up with a command that says, okay, just send me all the data. <laughs> and, then, and then your broker goes, because it just, yeah. you know, tried to reprocess everything. Whereas in Kafka, the data is still there. And it's also a, uh, it's a log on disk. So it's you're getting the speed of a seek, of a disk seek in terms of cool. I'm at I start the disk and I just read down and now I've consumed it. Where with Q with queues, right? You you can only read off of the head of the queue, mm -hmm. and your ability to even if you multi-thread it and have multiple consumers, they're still all just pulling off of the front of the queue. Where with Kafka, we can really say, okay, this chunk of the file is read by this one. This chunk of the file is read by this one plow through it quite a bit faster without taxing Kafka at all. Yeah, no, that's, and Kafka is wicked fast. I mean, just testing locally with Kafka well, running locally. Both fast. Yeah, they are. Like, that's not a fair thing to say. Like, Kafka has a specific speed that it does. Right. RabbitMQ is just as fast. I mean, your, your own benchmarks on your silly <laughs> hot laptop or desktop or whatever it is you're doing, you know, you're talking to millions of messages. Like, that's not slow. And your business is going to be significantly slower. You know, those that four millisecond database update. Hey, guess what? You're only doing 250 a second. You know, yeah. it's, it's called math. So I definitely get that. And that's and that's the thing, too, is, you know, they're all super capable of speed. The, the difference that you just kind of pointed out, though, is brokers, when I think of traditional message brokers, a.k.a. queues, they all have a locking or a visibility mechanism. I can lock the message at the front of the queue and another instance consuming from that queue is going to skip the lock messages and read from those, you know, read further down the queue. And, and that's the kind of thing I think that's the differentiator is that coordination and that locking to say, hey, I've got this command, I'm going to process it. And when I have processed it, I'm going to acknowledge it and it's going to be removed from the queue. And if I blow up and someone turns off the computer or that VM recycles, I'm, that message is still going to be at the front of queue for somebody else to pick up, mm -hmm. you know, and that's a distinction, just that locking coordination that a broker provides versus Kafka, which is you do have consumer groups and it will assign partitions, but that's the level of granularity of Kafka is it will assign a partition to only one consumer at a time within a consumer group. So it's going to partition. And with mass transit 810, we did, a lot of updates to handle the concurrency. And I talk about that in the video series specifically on the, the knobs that you can turn to control that concurrency. But we did a lot of painstaking efforts to both scale out by partitions, but also keep messages in order if needed. So that's kind of a cool thing. The, and to kind of pile on to some of the differences, and you mentioned broker, and I know that you and I have talked about this before, uh, RabbitMQ, ActiveMQ, SQS, 
uh, Azure Service Bus, they additionally come with the concept of topology, the idea of uh, I'm going to write or send the message to X, and then it's going to end up in Y. Not that you can't do that with Kafka, but you, but with Kafka, you're going to have to like, I copy the message to this topic, and then I'm going to copy the message to this topic, and then I'm going to finally copy message to this topic so it could be stored three separate times, and it's going to stay there until your uh, TTL expires. Compare that to RabbitMQ as an example, where you're going to write it to what they call uh, an exchange, and then through the bindings, it will get routed to the queues. Yeah, that's and that's you know when I think of message routing in the broker for sure, because Kafka, it's like you can read from that topic and only that topic, and yes, you can create consumers on topics that basically enrich data or modify data or filter data to push it into other topics for other downstream systems. So that's, you know, that, when I think of, you know, people building out things within topics is we would have a lot of raw data feeds coming in from three or four different ERP systems. And each of those would have a consumer that would say, okay, this is a piece of information that's important in this context. So it would then write that in a different format to another topic so that consumers of that topic were getting basically curated or you know edited and filtered down versions of the raw feed coming out of the ERP. So that's something that I see common in Kafka as well. Whereas I don't really see that you know in a broker-based system where people are producing events around. They can do it, but it's a lot of events bouncing around. Whereas I see that more in Kafka is like a lot of data enrichment and data shaping and mm -hmm. using KSQL queries, which then feed other topics, which feed events into other systems, which which is super powerful stuff. I mean, there's a lot of cool things you can do there. And a lot of it you can do by just plumbing JSON into a into a connector instance running inside a container somewhere. So a lot of cool capabilities. Both have their advantages. There's definitely some strengths. I mean, I'm a big fan of Kafka. You know, mostly because you can run it anywhere, and I know with you know Confluent you Cloud, you can't run Rabbit anywhere. You can run Rabbit anywhere, but I mean, in contrast to like Azure Event Hub, where you have to be on Azure for it to work. Fair enough. So, and I know Azure Event Hub does have an emulation mode okay. for Kafka. You can use the Kafka some subset of the Kafka API against Azure Event Hubs. Um, so, you know, that's that's always an option if you want to code to Kafka, but, you know, try to use the pass version. Yeah, it's definitely better than it used to be where you had to set up a, like a HD Insights cluster just to run Kafka on Azure. So the world has definitely gotten better. So I'm still waiting for that $20 a month Kafka cluster. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> it's called a cluster for a reason. <laughs> so, I mean, that's just kind of some general thoughts, you know, you know, the video series on the Kafka and the Kafka sample is pretty much done. I did cover some really cool Avro stuff, which I think is really slick. I mean, we have, you know, I think Avro is a great format to use with Kafka, and I think I covered that in the video. So if you haven't checked out the video series, it'll be linked down below. Um, any closing thoughts? I mean, you know, I love both. I love Everybody knows I love RabbitMQ, and I'm also a big fan of Kafka. So there's there's definitely value in having both, depending on the size of your organization and what your needs are. So, Just if you guys have questions, let us know in the video. Uh, we're going to be doing these, so we're happy to team up for later. All right. Well, thanks for joining, and we'll catch you at the next bus stop. <laughs>